What does film star Jet Li, Walmart chairman Rob Walton, and Sir Richard Branson all have in common? Well, you're going to have to meet today's guests to find out. From Blue Tribe Media, this is the Good Business Podcast, the show where we talk to business leaders, social entrepreneurs, and innovators about aligning profit with purpose and how you can make doing good good for business. Now, here's your host, James McGregor. Now, one of the things we like to say here at the Blue Tribe Company is that every time someone does business with us, something great happens in the world. And one of the reasons we can say this is because of today's guest. You see, in this episode, I'm talking with Paul Dunn, who is the chairman of B1G1, Business for Good, which is a global giving initiative that has enabled businesses to create over 200 million giving impacts globally. Not only is he an all-around good guy, but Paul is also a four-times TEDx speaker and award-winning entrepreneur. He has received a stack of honors for his work. He's a senior fellow on the world's leading business think tanks and is now a fellow of Singapore Social Innovation Forum, an honor he shares with film star Jet Li and Walmart chairman Rob Walton. He's also been featured in Forbes alongside Sir Richard Branson in a global feature on disruptors in business. And he's even been the recipient of a Global Lifetime Achievement Award for service to the accounting profession, and he's not even an accountant. In this episode, we hear about how a humbling moment associated with the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami led Paul on a mission to create a movement that harnesses the power of small. Why don't we start and uh, why don't you introduce yourself and tell everyone who you are? Well, James, first of all, thank you for having me here. It's uh, it's it's great to be with you. And uh, since it's morning time as we're recording this, uh, then it's pretty clear for me as to who I am by talking about why I get up every morning. Uh, so, <laughs> so I get up every morning to give uh, business owners uh, the power to create more impacts in their business, in their communities, and in our world than they ever imagined possible. So for me, it's all about uh, businesses making a difference, both both in businesses, as in business for good, and of course, making that flow out into our world as well. So, so t- tell us a little bit about B1G1. What, what is it and what does it do? So B1G1 is a social enterprise, which, <clears throat> excuse me, which has now formed into a movement. Uh, right now, there are some 3,100 businesses uh, as part of the, that movement. And, and what they're able to do is to say to uh, their customers, their prospects, their team members, this simple thing, which is every time we do business together, we make sure something great happens in our world. So it's kind of like a when this, then this. So it could be a simple as every time we send an email, for example, a, a child gets access to education, or it could be whenever someone buys our product, uh, you know, a, a, a bee farmer gets supported for an entire year. Uh, and there are some 600 very, very high impact and vetted projects, uh, which you can link the simplest activity to. As a, for example, uh, we now have uh, lots of people recognizing, like you do, that air travel is not necessarily a good thing because of the carbon dump, uh, but uh, trees are kind of nice. And and the reason I mention this is I don't know too many people who understand carbon offsets, but, you know, plain bad, tree good. So what we now do is we have a lot of people who are saying for every hour they fly, they triple offset, which means that they plant four trees uh, for every hour they fly. So it could be as simple as that or as, as, uh, as, as complex as some of the things I mentioned earlier. But essentially, the, the, the key to it is, is that this is forming a core part of your business. This is not something that you kind of attach on, if you will. It's actually right at the heart of your business. And that's what B1G1 enables businesses to do around the world. Yeah, great. I think that's, that's a great business model. So I, I, I actually built in when I started my company, I had B1G1 planned in from day one. Um, and that was only a few years ago now. Um, actually, one of the, one of the things I recall, and you're obviously a big part of you know the success of B1G1, um, and I recall our very first conversation when I'd literally just signed up as a B1G1 member and I had made our first giving um, after sort of three months in business, and then literally ten minutes later after I finished that, I get this phone call, and there's Paul Dunn on the phone, and I was amazed. It was such a such an amazing if I if I put on my business hat, I mean, what an amazing customer experience um and which is i think what b1g1 i mean that's i guess at the core of what b1g1 is about right well it is and it's also all about sharing the joy of giving you know frequently uh, that's not the way 
<clears throat> excuse me, that's not the way that giving is portrayed. You know, we see all sorts of, uh, you know, pictures trying to make us feel guilty, but that's not a sustainable thing. You know, we just don't like to feel guilty. But when we can do things uh, joyfully and when we can add, as, as B1G1, when we can uh, add like little moments, that one like you just described, thank you for remembering that, by the way, uh, then it creates exactly the, the right sense. And I think the right sense <clears throat> is yes, there are lots of issues in the world, and and, and we we really do need. We have an obligation, obviously, to uh, to try and fix those. But <clears throat> at the same time, we also need to understand that the beneficiary is not just the you know the person you know who gets access to water or, or you know whatever it is, but the beneficiary is us. Um, in the sense that, it, it, sure, it makes us feel fantastic, but at the same time, as you well, you're well aware, there are now so many stats that are saying, you know, when when businesses are doing great things, the business itself uh, becomes an even better business. Yeah, yeah, and I, and also I think even for the businesses clients, uh, you know, particularly in the space that I work in, you know, I work in you know, in trying to solve you know, inv- you know, really tough environmental and social challenges uh, in, in communities. Uh, you know, everything's from all the way from climate change to mm. um, loneliness for elderly people in households. Uh, and I think the people that work in that space um, who are our primary customers, it, it's sometimes being in that a sustainability professional is a bit like chasing a parked car. You know, sometimes yeah. the harder you run, the more it hurts. And yeah. there's so many frustrations and you just want to make a difference straight away and it seems to take so long. Um, so, you know, we use, you know, the, the, our B1G1 giving really strategically to, um, you know, give wins to our clients from, you know, their very first interaction that they have with us. And I think that's the great thing about what B1G1 does is that, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're selling coffee, coffee or whether you're, a, you know, you're a social enterprise. Um, it provides a vehicle for people to actually um, make that impact, even though their business may not have be able to directly do that. that that's right, and and I think what that also speaks to is the is the broader uh, understanding now that we all have. You know, at one point you used to have these silos, right? One was called marketing, one was called selling, you know, one was called whatever. Uh, but I think there's now a much broader uh, way of saying it, and it's simply about connection. You know, it's it, it's it's about connection to ourselves as business owners or as team members. Uh, it, it, it's that very important connection that we're feeling fantastic about what we do. And at the same time, this connection that we're able to make now through B1G1 uh, to the customer in the way in which you described, you know, with what we call gratitude certificates and all of those sorts of things. Uh, so, yeah, it's a, it's this very positive loop uh, and that's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, the, the uh, well, I think that what you're doing in the Good Business podcast is, is 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 like the exact thing, right? This is good business. It really is. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right. So, so what I'd like to do now, obviously, you're a really big part of B1G1. So I actually want to dig into a little bit about your bit of the backstory behind you know, who, who is Paul Dunn and how did we arrive at this place? Um, but the first thing, you know, obviously, you, you know, TEDx speaker and you're a prolific traveler and presenter uh, around the world. So people probably know quite a bit about you, those who know you. Mm. But what, what I'd really want to know is what's something that most people wouldn't know about you? <laughs> that, 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 that's a tough question. I, I, I think that let me, let me answer it this way. I, I think the thing that most people wouldn't know about me is that the, you know, you're supposed to have this kind of hero's journey, right? And, and what, whereas what I think of my journey as, as one of, uh, you know, just amazing luck, I mean, you know, gut ranging from being, you know, one of the first 10 in, in, in Hewlett Packard uh, way, way, way back when, uh, to having the fortune of, of um, experiencing what I would call moments, moments that just bring things to the forefront. And, you know, and that was how B1G1 was was really started. You know, here I, uh, here I was you know, running successful businesses and so on, thinking that business uh, was really about two things. And if you'd asked me back then, I'd have said, well, it's about two things. One, it is about providing extraordinary value to the people that you're privileged to serve. And secondly, it's about having fun doing it. Those were the two things. 
But then I came across a particular circumstance that happened to do with the 2004 tsunami. And, and it was like, oh, my God, there's something else that we as businesses need to be focused on. And, and that's recognizing that we're all one and that we have the responsibility to, and it really is, I think, a responsibility, uh, to, uh, to look at some of the issues that are out there and, and do our very best to fix them. And what's interesting, too, is, as you well know, is that uh, the United Nations has uh, at, at last recognized that, you know, because in 2015, uh, when they launched the Sustainable Development Goals, it was very specific, very, very specific that they actually said, you know, we are acknowledging for the first time that it is not governments that change our world. Certainly governments can enable it, right? But fundamentally, it is businesses and business owners and their teams that really can make the difference in our world. And as, as again, you might be aware, you know, Paul Polman, uh, the former, uh, the former uh, chairman, uh, CEO of Unilever, now uh, CEO of Imagine and uh, chairman of the International Chamber of Commerce, he talks about it this way. I mean, he says that this whole thing around uh, the global goals is the biggest business opportunity that we've ever seen, that mankind has been presented with, was the way he described it as. And so, you know, I, I think, uh, James, you could you could sum up my journey this way as saying it's, you know, it's an incredibly lucky one uh, to be at this place and connecting with so many people like you uh, who share this, uh, this same uh, realization uh, that business really can be an amazing force for good. Yeah. And I, and I think, yeah, that, that, the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, I mean, that's like the world's most important to-do list, right? Oh, um, yes, so I think it's, so. yeah, and, and when people look at those, that, those, some of those targets, you know, if I'm running a an accounting business, for example, and I look at how, how can I deal with creating clean oceans or um, mm. you know, dealing with poverty in the developing world, um, and I think that's where yeah, B1G1 does an amazing job to connect people through that. But I did want to uh, – there was actually one thing that people may not know about you, or they, they may, maybe they do. Um, that I was going to uh, throw in there is that Paul has the smallest business card of any man I've ever met. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, and and, I, and that's I, I, and it's just really clever because I think it, what it does it creates a conversation uh, when you hand that over to actually introduce B one G one and it's about how you use that uh, strategically. So, so we actually ha on our business cards we use it very similar, although. Yeah, you know, my, my my business card's a bit bigger than yours, Paul. I'm just saying, <laughs> um, and. And uh, like, even on the back of our cards, you know, we put things like, you know, I believe that every business has the power to change lives and be a force for good through its everyday business activities. By simply accepting this business card, you've helped uh, uh, to provide medicine to a nursery ch school child in Ethiopia, right? There so you go. what that does, it, it creates a conversation to bring up how businesses can actually, you know, start to take action, you know, that that most important to-do list uh, of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Yeah, exactly. And and, and it also it also underscores, doesn't it, is this whole thing that, um, you know, we, we often think like, oh, you know, someday, you know, when I'm successful or whatever, you know, I'll start to make a difference. And we forget that that's actually part of the journey. And we, we, we forget that it is actually about these tiny, tiny things, the power of small uh, to produce very, very large impacts when we collectively act on it. Yeah. So I just want to go back. You, you mentioned the tsunami, uh, the 2004 tsunami mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. um, just take us back, and that was that sounded like a quite a pivotal moment in your journey to where you are today. Can you just mm -hmm. t can you take us back and tell us, yeah, what 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 actually happened uh, in that moment? Sure. Um, well, uh, I was actually in Bangalore, and a friend of mine said, uh, you know, can you? I was at a conference and uh, attending it, and a friend of mine said, you know, can I have dinner with you tonight? Because there's someone I'd like you to meet. So I said, sure. And we went to this place, which was called the Taj. It very much was not the Taj, by the way, but it was called that. And, and I, I got introduced to a guy called Pastor Selva. And uh, during the uh, meal, uh, or right before the meal actually got there, you know, I was saying, so, okay, so what's your story? And uh, he, he told me the story that four years ago, this was, by the way, in 2006, and four years ago, he said, uh, you know, my church asked me to go and create a community in, uh, in one of the islands off India. And so we did, and I built this beautiful church, and da-da-da-da. And he said, but then that all changed about 18 months ago. 
and I should have realized what he was talking about, but I didn't. And I said, okay, tell me the story. He said, well, it was a Sunday morning um, and it was around Christmas time. Again, that should have given me the clue. And uh, he said, there we were in the Sunday school with 12 kids. And all of a sudden I, I heard, the, we heard this amazing noise and, and everybody was terrified. And I opened the door and I looked and, you know, there, uh, uh, not that far away was this mass of water, like a wall of water, the like of which I've never seen. And I said, okay, so what did you do? And he said, well, we got the kids and, and, and we said, let's play a game. Let's run to the high ground. And he said, so there we were running, standing on the high ground. And we watched as the church was washed away and, and we watched as their parents were washed away as well. And I honestly can't remember what I said at that point, but I guess it was something like what happened then. And and he told me how he'd been traveling around India for the past 15 months with these 12 kids. It took him four weeks to get off the island, trying to find a place to live. And and uh, finally, he someone had given him this this tiny tiny place. And and he said, but you know, now we uh, we have uh, the problem. The kids need to go to school. The kids need meals. The the kids need uniforms, which you need to go to school in India, uh, all of that sort of stuff. And I said, so how much does, does that cost? I mean, any, anybody sitting in that conversation would have asked the same question. You know, how much does that cost, right? And he said, well, thanks to your friend, the guy that uh, took me to dinner, he said, uh, we've been able to figure that out. And he said, it's $3,500 US. And I said, oh, that's per child, right? He said, no, 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 that's for all 12, right? And, and again, if you'd have been sitting in that room, you would have, you would have said, okay, well, it's fixed you didn't know how you were going to fix it but it you know it's fixed so you that's, that's what i was uh, able to do and some five weeks later and this is one of those things where i mentioned before these lucky moments you know and um i, I get this email from him and he's gone down to uh, uh, an internet cafe and he's borrowed a camera and so i get this lovely email and and four pictures are attached and the first picture is this wide angled shot of the house where they're living and the second shot is inside it and the kids are in this one room it's only one room in the house and they're in a circle and they're diligently doing their homework and you to see the kids have got their textbooks and and then the next one they're sitting around in a slightly different circle but the same room and they're eating and then the fourth shot is the one that changes everything because it's the it's a close up of the of the house and there across the top of the house they'd written in foot large letters Paul Dunn home. And when, you know, and when you see that, you go, oh, my goodness. And so that was just an incredible moment for me. And as you know, you know that, that doesn't necessarily trigger uh, uh, actions, but what it does, it, put, it, it hits the brain in a particular way. So then you become aware of things that were previously in front of you, but you never saw. And so that got me in that sort of uh, entrepreneurial social enterprise space. And that was when I, I met with with uh, my co-founder of B1G1, Masami, Masami Sato, who had this uh, amazingly simple idea, which was what would the, just imagine, she said, uh, what would happen if every time business was done, something great happened in our world? And, and that was the start uh, of B1G1 back in 2007. So, so you've had this, I guess, this experience where you know you've really seen what, what little it took to have such a huge impact on those yeah. kids and and that particular uh, community through from and so I understand like your background, you're like in back in computers and accounting. Yeah. Um, yeah. When you got that message, I mean, the, obviously there was a, a a switch was flicked in your brain. Yeah, um, but did you were you act actively thinking I need to do something about this, or was it you just kept going on? But there was something nagging. What, what was what were you thinking about what you were going to do next? Oh well, the, the, yeah, the, the the first thought was let's fix that issue, right? So then you fix that issue, and then to some extent you go, okay, fix the issue. No, that's it, right? But it wasn't until they I saw that Paul down home that I go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of like a, a, a call. And then I started going to various things that, uh, you know, were uh, kind of uh, in that space, if you will. Um, and 
you know, the reticular activation system was activated. Um, and as you know, when you're in that space, you meet uh, some incredible people. And then you also realize that these things are kind of challenging to do on your own and uh, that you need to uh, reach out and collaborate and all those sorts of things, which of course happened um, in the early days and still <laughs> thankfully continues to happen uh, in uh, in B1G1. Yeah. So it then became uh, a, a focus very much a focus of mine as to, you know, how can we uh, get the entire world thinking this way? Yeah. So you met, met Masami and she sort of put this seed of an idea in your brain. Mm -hmm. what, what did you do next? How did, how did you go from that to uh, deciding that you wanted to build something like B1G1? Well, that was it because, uh, you know, it, it, it wasn't just, you know, what would the world look like if you, if you did that, it was like, well, in order for the world to look like that, you need to build a movement. And and how do you do that? Well, you just uh, spend your time in front of, you know, speaking. And, and of course, I, I had that platform in a sense. You know, I, I was uh, 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 privileged enough to be speaking around the world anyway. So then I found a way of, you know, integrating uh, B1G1 into those conversations. And people went, wow, that's really cool. <laughs> and uh, pretty soon, well, I say pretty soon, it actually took three three years uh, to do all the structural stuff that had to be done, you know, like how do you find the projects? How do you evaluate the projects? How do you, you know, all of that sort of stuff, right? Um, how do you, how do you make sure that, uh, you know, in, in our, in our case, how do you make sure that a hundred percent of the giving that people do actually goes to the project? How do you make sure that people can give from just one cent? How do you do all of those sorts of things? So James, the, the tough part was, was, was that trying to figure that out, um, and being anxious to tell everybody. <laughs> so in those first, in those first years, it was, you know, this is what we need to do. Can you help with that. And fortunately, people said, yeah, I, you know, I, I can, I can do the legals. And then someone else would say, yeah, I can do this. I can do that. And uh, so it was, and, and I think that's, that's an important thing. You know, once you, one of the things that I talk about now is that is, you know, being part of B1G1 is really uh, being part of something bigger than yourself. And, and one of the things that I, I now understand even more clearly uh, is that this, this is actually the way to think about it. You know, a lot of people think, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, they're lost kind of thing. And so what they have to do is look inwardly. Well, I think I understand that. I really understand that. But I think it's so much better if we can learn to look outwardly. Right and look outwardly because then we start to see this this bigger picture and we understand perhaps even more clearly uh, the contribution that we in our individual or collective way can actually can actually make and to understand that we are actually part of whether we like it or not we're actually part of this bigger picture so we might as well start looking at the bigger picture and saying okay so. What is the part that we can play uh, in making that an even better picture? Oh, and I think the important part about that, looking outwards, um, and even you know, once you decided you know, this is what we want to build and this is the mission, um, is having that mission focus. Um, certainly, our experience has been um, you know, in, in starting our business is that having a clear mission and purpose, which you communicate clearly, so everyone knows why you're doing what you're doing, mm -hmm. actually attracts like people to you. So it actually brings the types of clients you want to work with who believe what you believe. It brings the sorts of employees to work for you who believe what you want to believe. So it's almost like gravity, right? It's like this force of force of oh, nature right. that starts to attract the, um, you know, the, you know, the same type of partners you need to make this successful um, because your mission's so clear. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds like, you know, the fact that someone says, hey, I can do the legals or I can help you with marketing or I can build a website for you. Um, you know, they, they weren't attracted to you because it was Paul Dunn. They were probably attracted no, no, to you because this is something bigger, bigger than themselves. Hundred <laughs> percent not. I mean, I mean, this may sound trite to say because you know people have been saying it since two thousand and nine. You know, when Simon Sinek did, you know, the whole start with why thing. But you know, he he, he nailed it. I mean, uh, uh, in spite of the fact that Mark Twain had nailed it hundreds of years before. But but you know, he said people don't buy what you do; they buy why you do it. People don't buy uh, uh, you know uh, what you do. They by what you believe in. And if that is fundamentally true, which I'm certain it is, then we need to be telling people, you know, why we get up every morning. We need to be telling people what we believe in. And, and, and we need to be doing it in such a way through, you know, simple statements like, for example, the way you had it on the back of your business card. So that when people 
hear or see that message, it's very simple for them to get so that they say, oh my gosh, I'd so like to be a part of this. And that's where the articulation of that bigger purpose is so, so, so important. And of course, that that attracts not just investors, not just customers, but also, and most importantly, it attracts team members and other partners to you in ways, it, it becomes this magnet. It's It's really powerful. Yeah, yeah, agreed. So you've you know started to build a bit of momentum. I mean, what what was what do you think was the hardest part about going from that initial conversation with Masami to actually launching B one G one into the world? Well, funny funny thing, I, I think now <laughs> that's a great question, uh, and I think the, uh, the the that part was actually the easy part, right? Because uh, and the the more difficult part, I think, is is this whole. A question of how do you scale? How do you how do you how do you move in the B one G one sense? How do you move from uh, uh, you know like a, an entity to a movement? How do you do that? And uh, I'm not sure whether this makes any sense, but <laughs> what, where, where I'm at right now is that uh, when you uh, when w- when you reach that point, you realize that the way for that to move forward is in this bizarre uh, kind of twist of things is for you to get out the way of it, right? <laughs> that's, and, and that's very challenging to do. It doesn't mean you absolve yourself of everything. It means that you realize that you're actually a small part of a larger whole, uh, uh, meaning WHO only, uh, rather than you know the whole thing. And once you, once you uh, d- discover that you've got to get out of the way of it, that it is actually bigger than you, uh, then that changes the way in which you act. It changes the way in which you see things. And that's not an easy task, by the way. Yeah. The, the, the founder's dilemma, right? You've, you've created yeah, this baby yeah. and it's yours and it's, you know, it's ingrained in your DNA and it's um, hard to to let it go. But I think that's why that mission focus is really important because if, yeah, it is. if, the, inten- if the intention is the mission, then you're, it's much easier for you to pivot to say, okay, actually, if I'm, I need to get out of the way f- to actually for this thing to achieve its mission. Um, exactly. Whereas if, it's, and, and- you're, if you're focused on the product, like if, if you're focused on we're going to build B1G1 and if you're always focused on the B1G1 entity, that's heaps harder to then step away from because you're no longer looking at the horizon at the mission. You're looking down at your feet. Uh, you know what this thing is that you're building. That, that's exactly right, and and uh, you know you mentioned uh, TED or, or TEDx before, and so you know I think most people would be familiar with uh, the distinctions between those. And right now, you know we're, we're we uh, for the last what eighteen months, there's been B one G one and B one G one X, which is this whole sort of uh, concept of member curated events. So what's so interesting, you know what's so interesting, is when I go to the member curated events, I so enjoy them even <laughs> even more than. And the ones that you know that we do because you know you're just getting this different flavor the whole time but it but in absolute focus on the mission as well so it's a very cool way to be tell us tell us what b1g1 looks like today well as we uh, as we're uh, doing this today i think we've got what's uh, b1g1 is in some 42 countries with pro- projects in i think 60 odd uh, countries uh some uh, 31 uh, uh, 3100 3, uh members business members around the world but absolute hockey stick growth uh, <laughs> someone was uh, reminding me uh two days ago of a conversation that uh, we had uh, some uh, two years ago. And I said, you know, wouldn't it be great if uh, we had, uh, you know, one new member uh, a day joining, if we could get to that particular point, right? And uh, we're, we're now, uh, it, uh, we're now, uh, well, let's say we're quadruple that. Um, and it continues to grow. So it's, we're seeing this hockey stick growth. And I don't think that's necessarily because of, of, of B1G1 itself. I think that, you know, the, the whole world is, is understanding, you, you know, that it's not about the stuff that we believed in 2008, right? You know, the, the greed is good. And we, we learned, you know, through the global financial crisis, that probably wasn't a good thought. Um, and so now we're, we're seeing very much this push for purpose. How great is it, for example, that, uh, you know, Greta Thunberg got, you know, person of the year uh, and uh, this young 17-year-old, you know, uh, refusing to go to school. And so I think that more and more businesses, more and more governments, I mean, here in Singapore, as a, for example, the, uh, you know, the uh, sovereign fund, Temasek or Temasek, depending on how you pronounce it, 
uh, is now only making investments uh, from the sovereign fund uh, uh, in terms of impact investing. You know, and th- those people have got to be lined up with the global goals, or else it doesn't it, it doesn't uh, pass muster. Um, so uh, you know, we're living at what what I think is just. I mean, I feel so lucky that you know I'm living at this particular point in time because there's never been a time like it, and uh, we're we're moving to becoming, in spite of some evidence of the contrary in certain places, we're becoming. You you know, so much more purposeful and understanding the role that meaning has uh, in terms of uh, in terms of you know the employment place and all of that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's a very exciting time. So if there's someone out there listening right now and they've had this spark, you know, they've had some event in their life that's um, switched the switch in their brain, mm. and they've decided they want to create something great to change the world um Mm. what's one piece of advice you give to someone like that oh (laughs) just just make make it yours just uh you know get as you you said I, i think what you said was really really powerful is is articulate it the, the mission in such a way and 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 don't go don't go out and say things like you know I'm going to change the world that that's 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 way too big for anyone to understand that they're going to go oh yeah you know uh, come and see me in a few years but when you can articulate it in a very very meaningful way you know again just listen back to this interview and listen to what you had on the back of your business card right uh, when you can articulate that in a very meaningful way then people are going to say to you, wow, that sounds great, you know, uh, let me help. Um, so I, I, I would say that's probably the central thing, being able to figure out how you can articulate it. And, and by the way, the articulation is not a 15-minute speech, right? The articulation is as few words as you can. Uh, and just practice it, right? So people can go, wow, that is so cool. Let me introduce you to this person. Let me, wow, you know. So I think that's probably the crucial thing. Uh, and, and by the way, the other thing I think that's really important is not to fall in love necessarily with, you know, the product or service that 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 implies, but to fall in love with the with the outputs, to fall in love with what that's doing to the customers of of you know of whatever it is you're doing, and and again, focus outward the whole time. Yeah, I, I think that last that last point is really important for people to particularly you know, budding entrepreneurs or people even trying to create a new product or service is yeah fall in love with the impact not the product yeah exactly. uh, because sometimes you will get the product wrong um, and um, if you're wedded to the impact it is so much easier to pivot away from something you know is wrong because your your objective is always to get to that impact um, so therefore you will ditch something you know is not going to work exactly um, whereas if you exactly. ca- come from the approach of the product first um, it's so much harder to let go Oh yeah, oh yeah. Because you, you know, you, you. I mean, you, the fundamental basis. You know, you got to let go of technology. You know, because you know, some new technology is going to come out, and and you better, you better be there. And if you're wedded to some particular way of doing it, then ooh, game over almost, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so if people wanted to get involved in this movement with B One G One or connect with you, what's what's the best way for them to connect? Well, very simple. They just go to uh, www.b1g1.com, which in the United Kingdom, by the way, people say, "Oh, you mean Biggie?" No, it's B followed by the number one, followed by the letter G, followed by the number one, and very simply a dot com after it. So, how about we uh, let's wrap up with what we call the Mad Minute, which is uh, five quick questions in. In mm-hmm. the goal is 60 seconds, but I don't think we've ever achieved 60 seconds yet. But anyway, <laughs> rapid fire questions. So okay, here we go. Uh, let's kick off. All right. So what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Create. Uh, okay. Uh, don't create follow. Don't create uh, followers. Create future leaders. Nice. Uh, and what's your favorite business book? Oh, I was asked that last night. My favorite business book goes back to 1983. It was In Search of Excellence. If Sorry. When you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? <laughs> <laughs> well, I knew what I didn't want to be because I grew up in a mining village and my dad wouldn't let me become a miner and go down the mine. So what I wanted to do was to to, uh, fi- uh, to fix TVs because uh, that was when I, <laughs> I, was, I wanted to be an electronics engineer and I, and I studied as that right then. Nice, yeah. I, I think I wanted to be a marine biologist and an astronaut. So I'm not sure how those two would have gone together. Very different uh, work environments. <laughs> they were different ends of the spectrum, aren't they? Which is kind of interesting. Uh, 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 moonlight on the weekend as a uh, marine biologist, bit of a long trip home, though I think. Uh, what's what's your favourite quote? 
Oh my goodness, that's a tough one. Well, I try try this one. Uh, it's one that I'm using a fair bit recently, and it is this: when your vision becomes more powerful than your memory, your future becomes more powerful than your past. Love it. That's a great one. All right, and last question: if you could go back in time and give your twenty year old self some advice, what would mm. it be? Oh, <laughs> that, that's pretty simple. It, it would be forget about you. <laughs> That that wraps it up. So, uh, look, you know, we feel really privileged to be part of the the B one G one community, and well, uh, I think it's an, yeah. Well, I think it's an amazing business model. I think it allows you know every business to make a positive impact in the world just through their everyday activities. Uh, and you know, even if you're an accounting firm or you're you know you're selling coffee down at the local cafe. Um, I think it's you know, a great business model to allow businesses to you know, work on that, you know, that world's most important to-do list of the UN Sustainable Development Goals uh, and uh, yeah, appreciate your leadership in this space and uh, you know, really value your, your time and knowledge and um, con- contribution to, uh, to, to our talk today. Hey, thank you, James, and thank you so much uh, for listening. That is you listening to us. And, James, thank you so much for hosting this. It's really a, a, a brilliant, brilliant idea. I hope you enjoyed that talk with Paul. Now, if you wanted to learn more about B1G1 or better yet, get involved, you can find the details for B1G1 on our website at www.bluetribe.co forward slash impact. Now, if you scroll right to the bottom of the page, you'll also find a unique code so that when you join B1G1 using that code, that an incredible impact is created by B1G1 to celebrate your joining. Now, to be completely clear, we don't actually receive anything for doing this, but it's B1G1's way of welcoming you to the tribe. Alternatively, if you'd like to see B1G1 in action, and we'd love to know what you think. And when you simply complete our short five-minute survey at www.bluetribe.co forward slash survey, you can choose a B1G1 project to support. Simple. Coming up in the next episode. The situation was dire when I got there. I, I really was confronted by a landscape on the point of ecological collapse. I guess in the next episode was instrumental in what has been described as probably the largest positive environmental transformation in all of Africa. This is a great story, and to make sure you don't miss it, make sure you go ahead and click that subscribe button now. Well, that's it for another episode of the Good Business Podcast. I'm James McGregor. Until next time.